sunshine day that the Lord's given us to come and worship. Prepare, prepare our hearts and minds to worship this morning. Let's go to God's Word. I want to share some verses with you from the book of John in chapter 3. Uh, these are verses 11 through 19. And this is uh, Jesus Christ talking to Nicodemus. At the beginning of verse 11, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak thee that we do not know, and testify we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I had told you earthly things, and ye believe not, now shall you believe, if I tell you of heavenly things. And if no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And the verse that we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the Holy Begotten Son of God. And then finally, verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Almighty God, our grace of heaven, Father, is then we now prepare our hearts to worship. I just pray, God, that we realize how important it is that we come into your house prepared to learn all that we possibly can. I just pray, God, as we continue through this worship service, you'll open our hearts and minds to be receptive. I pray, Lord, you lift Brother Gary up as he shares his word, your word through him this morning. We're just so blessed. Let us realize, oh God, how important it is during all these troublesome times that we learn to build and Strengthen our hope, faith, and trust in you. We thank you for this opportunity. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
cousins, uh, they were my, they were the people, you know. I had uh, some friends, uh, two friends, that, and, and this week I, they called me, I had a lot of my childhood friends call me and, and talk to me and, and tell me to call so and said, look, I called you to tell you to call so and so. And so, and uh, all the way through that, and I had a wonderful conversation with a lot of people that I hadn't spoke to in years and been with, involved with it years and everything. And I started thinking about heaven and, and running into people talking about heaven and all these different ideas that people have about heaven and everything. Uh, you know, one guy, he's talking about, well, I hope we can fish up there. And I said, you won't like it if you didn't. He said, well, I reckon I will. I said, you'll catch something every time you throw out something you want to enjoy it. <laughs> if people play golf, you'll make a hole in one every time. I mean, so we're not going to be fishing or playing golf. And, you know, I heard all this stuff about heaven. You know, and I got to thinking about heaven, what it's about, and, and about my family. I've got family up there. And all those things. And then it kind of hit me real hard like a hammer. God, are you comparing me for my death? Am I going to die? <laughs> because I, I had it on my mind. I had the, uh, the Lord on my mind, the coming of the Lord, and things on my mind, and everything going, and everything like that going on. And I thought, man, is the Lord preparing me for death? Here I am. I, and while most of them wanted to talk to me, was about the kind of about my sickness. They just heard about it and everything, and was worried and dead about it. And I said, listen, that's just, don't worry about it. Uh, I faced death before, and. Uh, uh, it's just, so it's, I told him, I said, I'm not worried about it. Susie's probably more worried about it than I am. And my grandchildren are probably worried about more about it than I am. Uh, because you know what? I have a destiny. I've been promised something. And this old world is going to get worse. If you're a Christian, this is your worst time that you're going to be living. Right now. I don't care what, I mean, you think about it. It's, it's not really good for us. If you're lost, this is your best time you're going to live. Because if you die lost, you're going to be in judgment. And it's not going to be pretty after that. And we quit talking about that in our churches because we're afraid that we're going to say something that's going to scare somebody. Listen, you better be people better realize that they're going to stand before God one of these days and there's going to be a judgment. But we as Christians, we have a destiny that's given to us that's something that's greater than this earth and during this time. I remember when they told me that I had the, the iron overload and the doctor was just telling me all about it and everything. We was, uh, I was in the hospital. Ben Susie sat beside of me there. And they were telling me, you know, that how long I had to live and what was going to happen to me and all this stuff and everything. And I'm sitting there just staring at him, looking at him. And he said, Mr. Robbins, you don't seem too anxious about this. And I said, Doc, I'm long to go. He wants me to live five years? Okay. That's what he told me. He said, you got about five years. That was a long time ago. My, uh, I, my boy wasn't even born then. If you're listening to this, son, I want you to call me, too. You can come talk to me a long time, so call me. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I, I said, I'm going to Lord, so whatever God, I, I'm going to Him. Whatever destiny He's got for me, I, I'm, it's okay. And he turned to Susie, and he said, Miss Robbins, what do you think about it? She said, and he, you know, he, that's what it is. That's how it is with you. Because I, you know, I'm willing to do that. And thinking about my childhood, how wonderful it was, heaven's going to be a whole lot better. Yeah. I want you to look in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. If you're able to stand, I want you to stand with me just for a moment as we look at this and try to get this kind of going a little bit. Listen what the Bible says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope 
by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Who, it says, who are kept by the power of God through faith and to salvation, ready to be revealed in the, in the last time. You think about that just for a moment as we pray. Father, we just thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. We thank you for the promises that you've given us. You've never failed. You've never failed any of them. We look to that, to the people that you promised in the Old Testament, and see that their faith and how they look for you. Even in the Old Testament, they were looking for you. Then we get in the New Testament, we find how that you help people during the times and the problems and the stress that they were going through. You helped them to overcome. As we have problems and we have stress upon us, and, and as we just learn to live with those and to get through those, to see how great you are. And we thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. In this, you have to understand that Simon Peter is writing to a group of people who were who had become Christians and began to serve God, and now they were being persecuted and scattered abroad. We know that from by reading in that how that he says that you're going to be punished uh, for wrongdoing, but if you're punished for good doing and endure it, you're more blessed. See, if I deserve to get punished, then I, you know, I'll not be thankful about for that, right? No, we all have to say, okay, come on. But if I get punished for something I didn't do, I'm supposed to, and, and endure it, I'm supposed to uh, uh, be thankful and reminded that I'm, I'm doing what God had me to do. And that's what they, that's what Simon uh, Peter was writing. God, through the Holy Spirit of God, was moving upon Simon Peter. Simon Peter just didn't sit down as a human being and write this. He was led by the Spirit of God to do this. So basically, this is God speaking. This is Jesus speaking. And it, we, uh, to, he was writing to those uh, who were scattered abroad and everything that was on it who were strangers. And they, they had to flee for their life and go in different places because of persecution. Guess what? When they get there, guess what happened to them? They got persecuted when they got there. You can't run from that. You can't, you can't hide from it. You can't hide from sickness. You can't hide from problems. You can't run. You can't move away from it. You can't get out of them. Um, I, I thought about, uh, I, had, I had horses when I was uh, growing up. My mother hated that. I know one time I come home from school and she met me at the, at the door. And she said, I got some good news and bad news for you. He said, the bad news is the, the horses are me and God let it go. And the, the, bad, the good news is I'm staying. <laughs> so I had to get rid of horses that day. All right. But I had a horse and he would run the fence. Just uh, the fence line, the whole thing. He would run it all the time trying to get out. Because he thought the grass was greener on the other side. We've heard that old saying and everything. And uh, he thought everything would be better on the other side. And he would run just constantly. Wore a big trench just right against the fence all the way around. He just never was satisfied inside there. He was watered there. He was taken care of there. And he could get out of the rain there. He could get out of the snow there. Everything that, everything that he needed was there, but he was never satisfied there. And I thought about it in our life, that's how we, we are. We're never satisfied. We think that we want something else. But God has a destiny for you. God has a, a program for you. God has a plan for you. And you'll never be happy. You'll never have joy until you find what God has for you. You'll, I, you'll never have you'll never, you'll never have the joy what it is about serving God till you find what God wants you to do and get in that. 
Then you'll find joy and you'll find peace and you'll find strength beyond. Uh, you'll have superhuman strength to, to do what God would have you to do. You can do it. Listen to what it says. We want to look at the source of our destiny or the source of who we are. It's in verse 13. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is where our source is. It is with God, the Father, and Jesus Christ. And, and in that, you have to understand that, that He's making Jesus equal to Him in that. Jesus even said that in John chapter 10, verse 30. If you look that up and see, He says, I and, and, and the Father are what? Are one. He said, I and the Father are one. Made him equal with God. And that's what uh, had to do. We, we have our great source of our salvation is based upon what Jesus Christ did on Calvary. I like the way that they decorate the church on for Easter and during the springtime and Easter time on it. Miss Landon, y'all do a good job. Thank you so much. And you have to uh, see, but the destiny, the source of it, is only found through God the Father and, and God the, the Son, Jesus Christ. That's where it's found. We try, humans, we're, we're trying to look for it everywhere else. These, uh, if you ever notice some of these TV preachers, how they preach health, wealth, and prosperity, just say it. Say it out loud, believe it, and it'll come true. That's a bunch of hogwash, folks. You can say something as long as you want to out loud. You can believe in something as long as you want to. But unless God is involved in it, it's not going to happen. You see, that, that's what Satan would say to you. Satan would say, listen, all you got to do, don't leave God in it. You, 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 you put your see when you start saying this that you're saying you're higher than God you're good just leave God out of it and all you've got to do is first believe what you want visualize what you want and speak it out loud because the words have power if you'll just say it enough it'll come it'll, you'll change it and it'll happen I got some tickle when I heard one of them talking like that. I thought, what in the world is he talking about? I'm trying to say hair grow on my head a thousand times and it's not happening. <laughs> it won't do it. <coughs> Just because somebody says that. And it said, you know, you're always going to happen. You, uh, you, and, and, but they do bring God in every now and then. They'll say, you know, God wants you to be a winner. You're a winner. Say that to the handicapped people who's pushing a wheel, wheelchair around trying to win a race. In that, we're God created us to worship Him, and to, and and for He wanted us to have He wanted us to have a great life. But man failed in the garden, and since then we are everything that we put our hands to. We tear up. If we hold on to anything long, we're going to mess it up. It's going to be destroyed. Because you know what? We're, we're, we're are not perfect and we, we're, we're just uh, sinners. And we that are saved are just sinners saved by grace because of what happened in our life. We think sometimes that we're perfect. I don't tell my wife, it's, you know, she thinks I am, so don't y'all tell her any different, okay? But we're not. Jesus ran into a bunch of religious people one time, and, and one of them asked him, Who is my neighbor? First he asked him, you know, what's the, the commandments? And he said, To love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy and soul, and strength, and to love neighbor as yourself. And then this Pharisee said to him, trying to justify himself, said, Who is my neighbor? That's what he tried to do. The Bible says he tried to justify himself by saying, Well, who's my neighbor? 
Because see, now Jesus knows what he's going to say to him and everything else. He said, when he tells him about the Samaria, about the priest, the Levi, it goes on by a man who's beaten up, but the Samaritan comes. And we always hear that about the Samaritan uh, do good and, and bring society to, and all these society and good uh, uh, things for, they want to bring in for people about raising money. Always, they always bring in that good Samaritan. That good Samaritan story is about salvation, folks. That's what that's about. It's to bring reality that we are lost and that we needed Jesus Christ. That's what that brings out. So, and that's why Jesus is telling him about this. This man has already just said to love to, you know, I'm religious, you know, and everything. And he says, uh, well, who's my neighbor? He's already, by saying that, he said he's loved the Lord God with all his mind, heart, soul, and strength. And then he's going to love his neighbor as himself. And then the Pharisee says, who's my neighbor? After Jesus tells him about the priest going by and the Levi going by, but there's some good, the Samaritan coming. People who the Jews hated. In 128, they tore their temple down. The Samaritan temple destroyed it. And Samaritans got happened because after the captivity, and the Jews come back, they try to hinder the work on the temple and on the city walls and everything else. And they, they became enemies a little bit on it and everything on it. And they thought that that's what they, they, they just didn't like them. And the Jews had nothing to do with it. They wouldn't deal with it. Especially because of Jeroboam. And all that and all, all those things happened. So when Jesus brings in a priest, a Levi, and a Samaritan in the story. Just to prove to, uh, and this is just to prove to this guy how lost he was. Because he had asked him about how does he, how do, I, how do I get this eternal life? He asked that question. And then he's going to bring in the law that he's keeping the law. That he's loving the Lord of God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength all the time. And that he's good to his neighbor and he treats his neighbor as himself all the time. He loves his neighbor as himself all the time. I don't do that. I got great neighbors. But I don't love everybody all the time. I'm trying to. I'm learning to do that. I'm trying to do that. But I don't. I don't treat everybody. You know, I'm driving down the road the other day and it was raining and there's a man walking. And I've had apologized to, to God and, I, and I've never seen this guy again on the road or nothing. But I should have stopped and picked him up. But I did. I did. I went round by him. He's walking in a room. And I, I've been sick of it ever since. My stomach has it's bothered me. And I hope to ever see that guy again. I'm going to stop and apologize to him and offer him a ride. But I may never get another chance in eternity because folks, what we do, we got sometimes one shot at it. One shot. And I have to realize that my destiny is relying upon Jesus Christ and Him only. The only way that I know I'm going to go to heaven is because of what Jesus Christ has done. Now look at it. Let's look again. In the same verse, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us again unto a living hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let me ask you something. Did Jesus Christ come out of the grave? Yeah. Yes. 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 And it's not a hope so hope that he did, right? right? No. It's a sure thing that he did. That's what he's talking about. Did Jesus die on the cross? Yes. That's not a hope so that he died on the cross. It's not a hope so that he come out of the grave. That, it's not like a, a, I'm hoping that Jesus died for my sins. I'm hoping that he came out. No, that, this hope means it's a sure thing. That's a thing that happened. And he says he's begotten us. That means that we were born again. The only way that you're going to get to heaven is being born again. You're not going to get there by trying to be religious. 
You're not going to get there by trying to be good. Because why? I don't. Listen. Do I look? I can't keep. The two commandments were wrapped up in those two things. And, and what he was quoting from was Deuteronomy and Leviticus. This is where he was quoting from. This this guy was saying that to love the Lord and God with all the heart, mind, soul, and strength. Deuteronomy. And then to love the neighbor as I said from Leviticus. He said, those are the two things. He said, that, that sums up the law of the, uh, the Ten Commandments. Part of them is, uh, the first part is written to God. Those are written, uh, the, uh, written on it. These are written just to God. One, two, three, four. Those five. All right. Then you hit five. Honor your mother, father and mother. Then it gets down. Thou shalt not murder. Those are written for me. How I deal with you. The first four is how I deal with God. The rest of it is how I deal with human beings. I can't keep the first four. To love the Lord thy God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength all the time. I can't keep it. So I need Jesus. That's where my source is. You see what God has done. And I have to realize that. And I have to keep my dependence upon that. And I have to keep paying to that. And looking to that. And depending upon what Jesus does. Then we have to look at something else. He says, be God. We, born, we are born to. That's the means of how my destiny is uh, because of what I, because I'm born again. That helps me. The source of my, of my destiny is Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. How I'm going to fulfill my destiny is being born again. Accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Realizing that I, that I was lost. When I was 10 years old, I was thinking about the church that I grew up in and how that it was crowded on Sundays and it was a big deal to go to church on Sundays. It was a big deal in Banner to go to church on Sundays. I mean, it was... Our parents, my, my uh, parents didn't say, do you want to go to church today? They never asked that question. It was, a, it was known for sure on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday, you was going to church. If you was too sick to go to church, you was too sick to get outside and play. We couldn't do nothing. I mean, you weren't allowed out. out. If you was, I remember one time I had the measles and I didn't get to go. We had a we had a, a field coming behind our house, a bottom of there, and we played football, baseball there, and everything else. And I'm sitting up in the window watching how many boys out there playing. I wanted to get up there and play football with them so bad I couldn't understand really stand it. But because I, you know, I didn't go to ch uh, church. I could have went out even if I didn't have to be. And I was, I, you know, I kept telling my mother, I'm, I'm feeling good, good. I'm not sick. I don't have a fever. Let me, no, you can't go. You didn't go to church today. You can't go. That's just where it was. But I remember when I got saved, I realized I was lost. And until you realize and come to the in your life and, and, and happen on it that you are lost, you'll never get saved. Because you'll think you're like this Pharisee. You'll think you're good enough. You think everything's okay. You think you're going to make it. I talk to people around this town all the time. They say, what well, I think I'm going to make. I talk to people in this town all the time who, who say they're Christians. But they act like atheists. Listen, you Christians that listen to this on it. If you're not going to come to church at least every now and then, and you're not going to pray, I had someone come up to me, and, you know, they found out, they just found out of sickness, they said, Preacher, I didn't know you'd been sick, I'm going to pray for you. I said, I don't need your prayers, buddy. He looked at me like, what? I said, look, I want somebody who can get in touch with God praying for me, and I just don't believe your lifestyle and how you live that you can get in touch with God. He said, that offends me. And I said, well, I meant to wake you up to reality. You say you're a Christian, but you ne I've never heard you see you in church. I've never heard you tell you doing anything godly. And that's your testimony with me. And I said, I'd love to see you get right with God because you know what? You're missing the destiny that God has for you. 
And he said, I've got to think about this. You see, you know what we, what we usually do? Well, okay, well, I thank you for the good prayers. Listen, I want, I want godly people praying for me. Lost don't need to pray for me. And if you're a Christian and you're out of the will of God, guess what? Somebody said uh, that your prayers can't be hindered. The Bible teaches that they can. Did you know, men, if, you're, if you don't treat your wife right, that your prayers are hindered? You better find that and look that up. I want you to look that up this week. That's in there. If you're not, so you think about it, our prayers can be hindered. If we're not in the will of God and doing what God has to do, He could be hindered. Now we know that God hears everything. But here's the difference. My children one time was playing with a bunch of other children. I heard one of my children, they were screaming and hollering and playing that big stuff. But I heard one of my children holler out in pain. I heard that. Now they've been screaming and hollering all the time. But get but soon as my child my child hollered. Now if your child had been there and hollered in pain, I may not have heard of that. But my ear was open to my child. And that's the difference that we have as being begotten or born again. Of. We know the things about being saved, about being born again. Here's what it says in verse 5. Listen. Who are kept by the power of God. See, when you got saved, you're not kept by being good. If you think you are, you're lost because you can't be good all the time. I mean, people say, well, you know, I, I don't want to sin and miss heaven when I, after I get saved. Guess what? Just by saying that is a sin because you're not really trusting God. Just by just saying that. Well, what sin is going to now you're going to do? Is it going to be speedy? Someone said, well... Literally, throwing papers out. You think that's a sin? Absolutely. I had a preacher one time with me. We'd come back from a revival. And we stopped at a place to get something to eat. And we pulled down the road. Before I could stop him, he rode down the window and throwed it back in that. I stopped the car and I said, you go back there and get that. You know, he never spoke to me for a long, long time after that. But I didn't care. I, I, I just think living to me, I, I, I go, I hunt, and y'all know, I go, I'm way back in the mountain. Go for, there's trash in the mountain. In that go birds and animals carrying their trash and birds going out. This makes me mad. <laughs> think about it. Way back in the mountains. Why? Because I think it's a sin. So you see, how do I know I'm saved? How do I know? I'm not perfect. I don't love God all the time. I don't think about Him all the time. I, there's, if I'm fishing, all I'm thinking about is get the fish on the bank or get it in the boat. For a minute there, I forgot everybody. I forgot God. I forgot everything. So how do I, how do I know that I'm saved? Verse 5 tells us. Who are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed in the last of that time. Now we hear something, we know about the three parts of salvation. I have been saved. Okay? Ten years old. I got saved when I was ten years old. I am being saved the present time. Sanctification. The Bible talks about sanctifying or being, being uh, sanctified. And in sanctification, through the Word of God, I am being saved through that. That means now that I, after I was saved, I find out I'm not perfect yet. And I'm still looking for that. And I'm still striving. And I'm still trying to live the things that God has to do. Getting out of my thoughts. Getting out of what I want to do. Take, taking away the things that, that, that would hinder me from being all that God has to do. Get those out through the Word of God. Learning to trust God's Word. Learning to uh, read God's Word. Standing on His promises. And then I will be completely saved over in glorification when I die and go to heaven. Amen. Amen. That's the three parts of it. There's not three parts of, us, of, of steps of being saved. It's part, all those are part of it. It's, it's the conclusion of it. And that's how he says, 
Here's why I've been in verse 6. I want, I want to say verse 6 for last. <laughs> Ain't you glad about the truth? It says, Wherein you greatly rejoice. I want to tell you all Christians something. I want, if you see me not happy as a Christian, you got my permission, my authority to tell me, Gary, why aren't you happy? You're saved. Why aren't you getting to the, you're saved? Because here's what the world is seeing today in us Christians. Oh, Lord, I don't know how we're going to make it. I'm tired of that in my life. Oh. Why, why would, you know, I, I go, uh, I, I was in a church one time, and I don't, you know, I don't like to eat out on Sundays, but I do sometimes, I don't but, and um, I had a kind of big congregation, and people were, always take me out and everything and do it and we go out and uh, I went out my first uh, month there I went out with some of the church members to eat and they were mean to the waitresses mean oh, the waitresses messed up a little bit they they didn't bring the you know, stuff right in on time and they kind of got mixed up who got what everything but there was all kinds of people in there. You have to think those waitresses, man, they're waiting on all kinds of people. They've got, they're struggling. And they talk mean to those waitresses. And it bothers them. Because here's a Sunday crowd of people who've just come out of church, going into a restaurant, and the waitress will tell you the worst day of the week that they serve people is on Sunday because of us church people. How are we at? I went to those waitresses and I I asked to speak to them and, and I gave them a big tip and I apologized to them and, and everything else and told them who I was and everything. They said, Preacher, we we deal with this every Sunday. And one of the reasons, one said one of the reasons that I don't even think about going to church is because y'all Christians had y'all at. I seen something with uh, some of the Christians here. Landon put one time they we were stopped at eating and they got overcharged or something. And they dealt with that so sweet, so easy. I was so proud of them. You remember where it was? And where we was at, where we was going. We on a little trip and going and and I watched them, how they dealt with that. And they did it so kindly and so Christian and so lovingly to them. Um, you know, how they were way overcharged for their beer. And I thought, you know, that's the kind of Christian I like to be out with. People who handle that stuff like that. Even if the world doesn't even take notice, we're still obligated to do it. Amen. And the only way that you're going to fulfill your destiny is through God, Jesus Christ. What God is doing and what Jesus Christ is doing. What God has done, what Jesus Christ has done is going to keep you that way. It's not on my good merits that I'm, I deserve anything. Because it's, I'm not good all the time. I don't do the right thing every time. But I have a destiny to do what God had me to do. With every head bowed and every eye shut for just a moment. Father, again, I just pray that if for someone in this building today that's lost, this will be the day that they'll come. And that you are dealing with them right now, showing and telling them that they, they need to be saved. I pray that anyone that watches this on YouTube or our local channel here in Jenkins, Channel 99, that if there's someone that's watched that not saved. 
I pray that when they see this or hear this, that you begin to deal with all their life and convict them and bring them under the conviction that they need Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That they're not going to make it any other way. And they're not going to be kicked any other way. Maybe there is a Christian that's just forgot what Jesus has done for them, what Jesus means to them, what Jesus has done for them. And they've slept off, or we've slept off God as Christians, I should say. I ask you to forgive us for that. Our country, God. Don't give up on this country, God. I beg you, I beg you. Don't give up on this country. Don't give up on the world. Please don't. I'm sorry when you did. And I'm sorry that churches are not growing. I'm sorry, God, that I'm failing you. I'm sorry that sometimes I fail to thank you for all that you've done for me. I need your help. Don't give up. Someone needs to receive Jesus Christ today, they'll do it. Say, God, I'm sorry that I'm not doing it. Won't you forgive me as a sinner? And I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I, I pray that they would do that and believe and trust in that. Father, we thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.